The Pentagon operates more than 1,000 military bases in foreign countries, plus another 4,000 bases here in the U.S. My guest, Elizabeth Cobbs Hoffman, professor of American Foreign Relations at San Diego State University, argues in her new book, American umpire, that it's time for the U.S. to reevaluate the cost and responsibility of policing the world. Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you. You've written sequestration cuts are actually an opportunity to talk about why we're, quote, still fighting World War II. What do you mean by that? Well, we often say, why are we still in Iraq and Afghanistan? But the fact is, we're still in Japan and Germany. And these are bases that are left over from a commitment we made at the end of World War II, which was to rescue a world that was broken, uh, that was bombed out, and that was busted. And we did that. But uh, it's time now to, to let that world take on a new dimension. To, to shift a little bit, now the Pentagon estimates our foreign military bases cost about $22 billion a year. Independent estimates uh, say that's much, much higher than that. Is your book about uh, basically the money, what we can save, or is it about sort of this shifting role that you were talking about? I think it's both. Uh, the book is a history book, and I start with George Washington, I come all the way up through Barack Obama. But what it does is it says that we, take, we took on a specific role for a specific reason, and to the extent that those reasons no longer pertain, we need to look it out, out for ourselves financially as well. The United States spends almost 5% of its gross national product on, on defense. Countries, other countries spend a fraction of that. Japan, it's 1%. Uh, UK, it's 2%. France, it's 2%. So we spend quadruple, triple, double what others do. It's not right. And, and you suggest we could maybe cut some of that spending by pulling military uh, bases or, or our presence in, particularly you said Japan and Germany. Why those two countries? Well, those were places where we set bases because at that time, Germany and Japan were considered renegades. They had to be watched. They also had to be defended. But we no longer need to defend the French against the Germans or the Germans against the Russians. And we probably shouldn't be there. Um, we just saw a, a cover of your book, American Umpire, and the title of it lends to this idea that, you know, our allies maybe should start being an umpire as well, um, helping to pick up the cost and the re responsibility of policing the world. Do you think any of our allies would be willing to step up to the plate? Oh, pardon the pun on that one. <laughs> well, I think that they have. I think the French are doing more, the British have done more, the Canadians are doing more. I actually uh, met the Canadian uh, foreign uh, uh, minister of defense, and he said, you know, Canada is on top of some of these issues. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a truism that good leaders develop new leaders, and that's important for everybody's interests. Uh, what's your response to the argument that cutting back on U.S. bases either threatens our national security, international security, or it gives the appearance to our enemies that, ah, eh, we're not so concerned about you? No, I, I think that it's possible to give a very different message in relation to all that. I think that we can say with confidence that we've performed this role and done a very good job considering how unprecedented this role is, but that it's a part of the role to let others take up some of the slack at this point. And I think that that's a good message. Do you think the Pentagon or Congress will hear that message? Do you think this is something they would actually... Um relate to and say this is an idea and support it? Well, I mean, I think we've seen the beginnings of that even in the last election with people like Ron Paul questioning the basis. But I have to tell you, I've gotten a tremendous amount of feedback from former military personnel who say that it's time. We've been doing it and others really need to take up some of the, some of the burden as well. Practically, what the, would be the next steps? Well, I think to just think outside the box, to understand that we had a specific role, that it's time for that role to shift, and, and to begin thinking in terms of cutting back on the percentages. That will force others to come up uh, more to the mark. And you wrote in the New York Times that you thought China could also step up to the plate. Um, how so? Well, for example, in the current situation in North Korea, the only country that has a real control or real influence in North Korea is China. Now, China's new best friend ought to be South Korea. They're the ones that they have a lot of ties with. If something happened to South Korea, that would be a big chunk out of China's economy. So China has a lot of interest in making sure that North Korea you know, resolves its differences. And really, the Cold War on the Korean Peninsula needs to come to an end. And, and it sounds like you're talking really about diversifying um, sort of all the allies as far as not just having the U.S. have this strong presence 
uh, throughout the world, but this diversification, do you think that improves our, our standing in uh, foreign countries as far as uh, foreign relations? I think it does because I think that one of the things that's harmed the United States is the perception that we do this because we're power mad and you know we, we think arrogantly that we're the only ones who can provide this kind of service. So I think in many ways uh, the United States will always be one of the largest, wealthiest economies in the world. We don't need to prove it and reprove it all the time. All right, we are out of time. Elizabeth Cobbs Hoffman, professor and author, thank you so much. Thank you.